the majority is a no. LGBTQ History Month in Miami-Dade schools declined. Viva la Santísima Virgen. Excuse me. Excuse me. A fiery crowd. I will press charges against anyone who talks about sexuality to my children. Fear of discrimination and exclusion. Who we are as one is really important. A split board facing new state law. We've put in all the legal protections, and that includes no instructional materials. And if this court doesn't step in now, there's an even more dangerous six-week ban waiting in the wings. Now in the hands of the state's highest court. I understand the plaintiffs have raised substantial concerns. And that kind of weighing and balancing should be done by the legislature and not this court. Will state deadlines remain for terminating pregnancy? We take it to the round table. From South Beach hotspot to affordable housing. It allows us to switch a very profitable business model into a different profitable business model. It's pretty outrageous. This is an attempt to use a state statute to maximize profits at the expense of one of the most beautiful pieces of real estate. State law versus local planning. But we're not preempting uh, local zoning ordinances. Uh, we are asking the fa fast track changes that they make. The big news of the week and the round Roundtable takes it on all live this week in South Florida. Good Sunday morning. I'm Glenna Milberg. We begin with that month of celebrating the history and achievements of the LGBTQ community created almost three decades ago and this week rejected for the second year by Miami-Dade School Board. A marathon lineup of speakers took the public hearing well past midnight. Emotions high and in some cases respect levels low prompting the board chair to demand decorum and the superintendent to draw a line. When I hear a comment that says that we're scaring children and that we are increasing or contributing to mental health illness of our children, I simply cannot accept that. Like last year, board members who voted the against majority, a Pride Month um, raised concerns that it no. could put the district or teachers in a position of violating new state laws that put limits on sex and gender education. Those supporting History Month drew distinctions between a celebration and actual curriculum. We've put in all the legal protections, and that includes no instructional materials, making sure that nobody's forced to partake in any uh, activity. The vote to reject was five to three, one absence whose vote would not have changed the result. The school board is a nonpartisan entity, though here's important context. The new majority of five is comprised of the most conservative members of the board. All but one were elected or appointed in the last 13 months. Board member Roberto Alonzo elected last August. He is back with us here to get into some of the context and the detail. And you've been with us before, but first time at the table. No, thank you, Glenna, Welcome. for having me here today. Welcome. So there, this whole hearing we were talking about kept you up really late, and there was even meeting after you were finished. Um, but despite all of this passion and the sound and the fury, this board knew how it was going to vote. It was telegraphed at a committee meeting days earlier. So, so tell me about that context. Well, I think it's important for, for residents to know that, you know, all these issues come before us at our committee and we discussed what it is that we're going to be doing within our school system. Um, and we have to follow the law and we have to really focus in on what's important and what are some of the bigger issues that we're dealing with at our school system when it comes to student proficiencies as well as security of our schools. So, I mean, you deal with a lot. Th this is one of, I think it reflects the states divide over things, these cultural, culture war issues is I think the term people use. Um, so last year, the board rejected, when the first year of the parental rights and education law, the board rejected this LGBTQ month, bec largely because of the law, and it was an eight to one. It was almost unanimous in its rejection. This year, it was very much more split. Why, why was that? The, the rules hadn't changed. Why that disparity in vote, do you think? 
Well, I can't speak on behalf of other board That's members, true. Okay. Um, true. but I can tell you for myself, uh, I just was re recently elected, and I knocked on thousands of doors speaking to family members within my community, which I represent, and many of the family members, I say the majority, um, did not want to be discussing any of these topics within our schools. We have to follow the law, but we also have to listen to our residents and the parents, which are the ones that are telling us what it is that li they like our students to be listening to inside of schools. And one of your colleagues on the board, Monica Colucci, said something very similar that she had heard from constituents. So you hear this sort of outcry, and from sort of a, a news point of view, we've been covering so much more of this. Two years ago was the last month that, or the last year that the school district celebrated this month. I don't remember any outcry. I don't remember a debate or, or the passions that we see now. What do you make of that? Well, I think uh, we all saw during the COVID months where parents became more involved in the education of their children. Um, and I think it's important for us to always recognize that there is a, a month, which is the month of June, which we celebrate LGBTQ as a nation. It's a federal holiday. And a lot of the parents have come up to us and said, look, there's already a month. We don't need to have an additional month. The school needs to be focused on math, English, history, sciences, and the core curriculum that needs to be taught inside of our schools. So let, let's talk about the curriculum is very much a part of the new parental rights law. It is strictly uh, sex and gender education will not be part of the curriculum. First it was K to three, then it was expanded through high school. Uh, last year, the proposal to celebrate LGBTQ month in October had curriculum as part of it, uh, studying I think Supreme Court cases that benefited the community. This year, the sponsor said she was very careful to leave curriculum out of it. Your school board attorney said oh, it was okay, it passed legal muster. Did that play into your decision at all? Well, my two sisters are teachers. They're elementary school teachers. And I think it's important for us to realize the pressure we put on our teachers when we do some of our decisions and things that we decide on as a board. If we come in and we start celebrating a month within our school system, even though there's no curriculum inside of the actual item, our teachers are gonna be forced to have this discussion with their students. So as we were talking earlier, you know, think about being a third grade teacher and a student coming to talk to you and asking you what a transgender is. That's a very difficult topic that we will then expect our teachers to discuss. Did you, have you talked to teachers at all? Have you heard from them? Definitely, I've visited all the schools within my district and spoken to teachers, and I tell you, the vast majority do not want to discuss these topics in the classroom. They have a big task ahead of them. Um, many of our students have fallen behind, and they need to focus on those core competencies to get the students ready for a brighter future. And do you hear and, and do you advise your teachers if there is a student who, I, I mean, this is, you know, we live in a world where this is not uncommon, especially in South Florida. The LGBTQ community is a significant part, uh, part of our neighbors and communities. And, and do you hear or are you asked about how do I handle when students come and talk, whether the student is a part of the community or has questions, how, how do you recommend your teachers handle that and, and feel safe from legal challenge? Well, I think the beauty of it is that this district has been always very uh, accepting of all cultures, all um, you know opinions. We're a very diverse community as Miami-Dade County as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, so our teachers are always used to being able to do that. Our district has always been focused on the mental health and providing a counselor in every single one of our schools. Every school has a counselor that is always available to discuss any issues with our students. And what we advise our teachers are is, number one, incorporate the parent in the conversation, and number two, bring the counselors in, but always put in the safety of our students first in everything that they do. That, that goes to something I really wanted to talk about. Um, there is, and you heard the superintendent especially, you know, there is a significant component of Miami-Dade School District that is an LGBT, LGBTQ community, families, students. With the anger and venom that they are now subject to if they watch this hearing, and, and I mean no disrespect to anybody, but hearing that for someone with a personal stake in it could be very harsh and very hurtful. How do you telegraph to those communities that they are accepted and included and supported in the district? Well, look, it was said by some of the speakers that in every one of our families, we have an LGBTQ individual um, within 
all of our families. So we are all very accepting of all cultures, of all sexual preferences and their views, um, but we have to also understand what the role of the school is and what our, we're here to do. Um, so I tell the community is our schools are always accepting of all students. We celebrate all students regardless of their race, their color, their religion, or their sexual orientation. Um, at the end of the day, we don't walk into a classroom to ask a student what's their sexual orientation or where they came from. We're there to celebrate their achievements when it comes to the education that they're receiving and to prepare them for the future. So when you hear uh, people talk about or reports of how, what a cultural split this is and how damaging some people see this, what, how, what is your perspective on that? I mean, how would you answer that? Well, I think that as a community, we have to come together. Um, what we saw the other day of spending 10 hours arguing and bickering back and forth does us no good. Um, it does not solve anything. Our children are watching us. Um, and I think we have other bigger pressing issues, like we were talking earlier, security, um, proficiencies, that we need to focus on our schools. And that's what we really need to come together. If we really want what's best for our students and for our children and for the future, we need to come together on the important topics and accept of each other, regardless of where we stand on some of our own personal thoughts. And you were saying that after this vote was taken, what were you discussing next? It was one in the morning, school security? Yep. It was one in the morning. Anybody left in the audience? <laughs> there was nobody there. It was an item that's very dear and hard to me. Um, we've had a lot of students uh, that have been scared in the recent weeks because of some squatting calls within our oh, schools. Wow. So we want to make sure that our parents know that we're always doing what's best to keep our school secure and to educate our students on what it is that they should be doing and not doing because it is uh, incriminating in many ways if they do any of those crank calls. Um, so that was a big focus of our meeting after, um, which unfortunately only took five minutes and there was no parents or community leaders there to listen or to discuss. Well, there's an upside to five minutes to decide something also. Yes. <laughs> Roberto Alonso, great to have you aboard. You. Open seat whenever you want to come back. Great to have you. Thank you, Glenn. Appreciate it. All right, next we take this and more to the round table. Stay tuned. A lot on the plate for the roundtable today. We've already started behind the scenes. First, some introductions. Mark Caputo is national political reporter at The Messenger, a not-so-new-now nationwide publication. L'Oreal R. Scott chairs the Miami-Dade Independent Civilian Panel and is past president of both the Wilkie D. Ferguson Bar and Gwen Cherry Black Women Lawyers Association. Tom Hudson is senior economics editor and special correspondent with our friends at WLRN. Kevin Cooper is vice chair of the Republican Party of Miami-Dade. All veterans of the round table now, welcome aboard. Thank welcome you. back. Thank, Thank you. you for having us. Of course. So you were able to hear the, uh, the last segment. Um, you are an ace political reporter, but you're also the husband of a teacher. So you get the first yeah. question. Erin is going to be on the round table one of these days. I don't think we'll she'll, she'll want to do it. What, <laughs> what, uh, you're intimately involved in the Miami-Dade school system in some respects. What, what's the perspective of the families, teachers about this? I mean, just from my talking to my kids and talking to my wife, this is a debate that they're having on the school board and in Tallahassee that no one is really talking about in the classroom. I mean, my kids yeah. haven't been taught how to be gay or trans or bisexual for the whole time they've been there. My oldest daughter is now at FSU. She's a junior, right? So that didn't happen the whole time she was in public school. My other kids who were respectively in middle school and high school, that hasn't happened. And my, teach, or my, my wife, the teacher, has not taught anyone, instructed them on LGBT-related things. You know, you bring up what the, the buzzword that we hear is indoctrination, and that's been used a lot in Tallahassee during the passage of the parental rights laws. Kevin, my, my Republican on the panel today, yes. um, you know, you hear that it's not, it's not really part of the, we've been to public school, I don't remember that either. Um, but now you heard Roberto Alonso talk about, it's, uh, you know, COVID, people are very engaged, parents are very engaged. Is, is this a necessary thing? Look, what this, what this proposal does is it's trying to transfer what was once a fight in the state house to now to the local level. And I believe that this is a proposal that hasn't been fully fleshed out because... But when you talk about proposal not fleshed out, which... Because it doesn't have any associated curriculum with it. So it places teachers in the impossible position of having to teach a topic that is very sensitive without any corresponding educational material on it. And so I think this is something that's very, very sensitive to a lot of people, to both teachers and to students who are LGBTQ. And it has to be done in a way that is in a complete package that is able to be taught. You know, one of the things that I thought was very no noticeable if you watch the public outcry about it is that there are groups very involved with it and, and um, with a big platform for it that really don't even have kids in public schools. I mean, well, what does that tell you? 
So that tells me that the boisterous minority just wants to be heard. So what's interesting is, is that a bad thing? In our democracy, it's not a bad thing. What becomes problematic is when they attempt to overpower the will of the majority. So what we found interesting with Mr. Uh, Chairman, I'm sorry, not Chairman, School Board Member Alonzo's comments was that he heard from the parents, his constituents that were parents. Dr. Dorothy Bendros Mendigal stated that she changed her position because she heard from the students. So, you know, your kids might not be talking about it. We're definitely not being taught how to be gay in school. But the children who voiced their concerns to Dr. Bendros Mendigal stated that they wanted some type of recognition. There is no curriculum involved. So there is no indoctrination. That's the red herring. And there's no mandate to teach anything regarding this recognition of a month of a class of people. I think the other piece that's important here to your original question is that we're all uh, engaged with public schools, regardless if we have kids in them like I do, uh, we have family members who may work there. The entire community is interested and has a stake in public schools. But you take a look at this debate, it happened at a moment uh, in the same meeting where the school board, the largest school district in Florida, one of the top three largest school districts in the nation with a multi-billion dollar budget, spent less time talking about spending billions of dollars than it did talking about a recognition of a month. No, I was just saying, I, I wanted to kind of pull back the lens to Tallahassee, which is where this began. And I think what a lot of people don't understand is just the evolution of this and what it says about kind of the dysfunctional political system we have and the media's inability to cover it. And so lawmakers came up with this idea, you shouldn't teach kids in K through three uh, sexual orientation and gender identity. Right. Well, but it wasn't being taught. It wasn't being right. taught. Right. So, Republicans went to ban something that wasn't being taught. And yes, I understand maybe there's something on TikTok someone I, might have seen. Right. And then Democrats jumped up like, how dare you? So their reaction on the Democratic side is, is if it was being taught. And so suddenly we're covering this derivative thing that's not really happening. And, and, Glenn, and it's occupying all of our attention. A solution to this would be for the Department of Education to speak with clarity regarding a school, public school district in Florida recognizing LGBTQ plus month if they wanted to. But there's been no clarity from the Department of Education regarding such recognition. Do you think that the, the vagueness, not only of this particular issue, but the vagueness of the actual law is what really is the chilling effect to what could be a very normal school day? Exactly, so they made an issue out of a non-issue, right? Uh, that's the premise of that. The chilling effect is you put shackles upon the teachers as to what they can and cannot discuss. I mean, let's face it, our kids are learning about sexual orientation on TikTok and on any other channel that they tone into these days. But neither the law nor this particular month has anything to do with what teachers can or can't discuss. There's, you know, discuss is different from instruct. Remember that, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. I want to mention though. You know, you said TikTok, and we're all talking about these things that are outside of school, right? And so there is also a place for parents to discuss these issues with their children, and for the community to discuss these issues with their children outside of the school. And so we have to also be cognizant of that as well. That there is a place for these types of discussions, and it is also outside of the school as well. But as yeah, I'm sorry, Glenna. As a parent, I would prefer for my children to have an informed, educated conversation with their teachers, highlighting the notables in the LGBTQ community versus learning skeptical information, fake news on TikTok and other sources. But are you sure what your teachers are telling your students is what you'd like your teachers to be telling your I students? I appreciate. The only part of the Parental Act that I appreciate is that the subject matter has to be cleared by the parents first. So I appreciate having the parents' involvement to making us aware of what the curriculum is but that's back to your point. If it was a clear curriculum, then the parents would be informed and we would be able to voice our informed concerns at that time. I just want to mention one thing because we're talking here about curriculum, parental choice. None of that was in this proposal at the school board. There was no curriculum to go along with it. There but was it, no but ability that, to instruct it. Right, and so, and so isn't that an argument for it would be fine because there's no curriculum and so it comports with the law? Well, I think if, if somebody has a proposal, they should give you the entire proposal. I think if someone is saying this should be brought into the schools, how are you going to teach it? How are you going to discuss it? How is this item going to be explained to students when students ask, what is LGBTQ History Month? I think there needs to be 
an explanation. There needs to be curriculum along with it. And that mm -hmm. as a package can be discussed at the school board. But just throwing this out as, as a kind of a, as an idea without giving a full instruction, teachers are, are very concerned about this because they are not given the necessary material to go and instruct this topic in the classroom. I think that begets another situation, right? If a school district or school board is going to pass any kind of proclamation recognition for anything, are you saying as, as due course that proclamation needs to come with instruction? It should. It should. I, I believe that it absolutely should. Because how Otherwise, do you don't recognize it. Well, I'm not saying that. I'm you not saying don't recognize it, but I say you ha when you're going to recognize something, it has to be done complete recognition. Not every teacher is trained in every single topic sure. that they're teaching, so it's good to have instructional material to go along with it. It's good to have coursework that they can use to explain this topic. Th these are very sensitive topics. Kevin, yeah. when you write that bill that you're taking to the legislature, can we preview it right here? That would be <laughs> great. <laughs> All right, well, um, sit tight. We are coming back with the roundtable again after the break and another of the state's most divisive issues, Florida's abortion restrictions right now in the hands of the Florida Supreme Court. Now in the court hand, Florida Supreme Court heard arguments Friday in the case that determines whether the state's new abortion restrictions are legal and enforceable. The plaintiffs that brought the case, Planned Parenthood of Southwest and Central Florida, argue that the state's right to privacy in the state constitution covers the right to privately choose to terminate a pregnancy. Florida's lawyers argue otherwise. Back to the round table now, uh, and we have a lawyer amongst us, L'Oreal R. Scott. So the right to privacy in Florida's constitution, um, you know, that that is the question, full stop. What do you think is going to happen there? <laughs> so it's going to be interesting to see what the court does with this. The right to privacy as it relates to abortion rights has been codified in Florida's um, judicial precedent for a very long time. The constitution is very clear. We have a right to privacy. Uh, public intrusion specifically. So what I thought was interesting when I looked at the um, court's oral arguments is the court started out within the first couple of minutes into the questioning discussing standing. Every lawyer knows that's not a good place to start. That means the court is questioning whether or not the plaintiffs even have the, the power or the position to bring the lawsuit. And, and they decided that they did. Well, the court is, the jury's still out on that, as they oh, say. Okay. The court is still deliberating that one. And they were hammering both sides as to that particular issue. And, and they moved on to an argument then, and this is really central, if they decide that the plaintiffs have standing, in other words, they have a complaint to take against the state with the 15-week abortion ban, they moved quickly on the, the enshrined in the Florida Constitution, 1980, the right to privacy. Is it informational privacy only? or is it decisional privacy as well? And that's the real kind of fork in the road that the Supreme Court justices are gonna to have to decide. Is, is there a prior case that speaks to that? There I, is. I, I'm, I'm sorry. Please, no, you just, you're you just the lawyer. Stuff. Yeah. Oh, I don't know stuff. I just watched the oral arguments and did a little research. So the court was very clear that all the prior precedent protected that decisional right. right to privacy and actually questioned the state as to why the state is deviating for, from its previous positions uh, and now putting the tooth in the informational privacy uh, position. I would be very surprised if the Supreme Court uh, does not uh, overturn the prior court. So let's just a few dates. 1973 Roe v. Wade. 1980 Florida's constitutional amendment, right to privacy. Mm -hmm. If you look in the news clips from the time, there's no mention of abortion. 1989, about, there was a case where it, they read into the right to privacy. Correct, that, but that's after that it's passed in 1980. But at right. the time in 1980, people aren't talking about abortion. According to the news clips, John Coriel, one of the, the Supreme Court justices, specifically zeroed in yeah. on that. 89, there's the ruling. So. Carlos Muñiz, uh, the Chief Justice, all of these justices, they're very conservative. They're going to take an originalist position here. They're not going to, they're going to see that in 1980 this discussion really didn't happen, although it is true at the time the right to privacy was discussed in regards to abortion. But in the context of Florida's voters at the time, it doesn't appear in the media at all. And now, all. And now it's all about the media because right. of right. the and past so two sessions. I, I think it's important to, to recognize too, while there is a right to privacy, there's no right to an abortion in the Constitution of the state of Florida. And so people need to recognize too that up until now, this has been something that has been on the books, the 15 week abortion ban. Does that matter was on because the books. There's, there's, if you look at, a, you know, pregnancy termination is a health issue, okay. considered a health issue to, to many people. And the Constitution doesn't spell out what health issues are allowed. So does that does that matter? 
That's why we have a legislature. And the legislature voted on this issue. We had an election in 2022, and the people understood that abortion was on the ballot. It was something that was discussed at the debates for governor, in the legislature, all throughout our county, throughout our state. And people understood what they were voting for, in my opinion. And they voted for Republican policies. They voted to make Florida more pro-life. They, they recognized that this was on the ballot. Democrats campaigned on this issue. Well, just to be very clear, the 15-week abortion ban at the time, 96% of abortions happen in Florida within 15 weeks. DeSantis then gets elected. He then does a six-week abortion ban, which is essentially a complete abortion ban when you talk Under to women. a much lower profile, which right. was interesting. He ducked the question on yeah. the campaign trail right. whenever yeah. he was asked about it. Yeah. He's like, oh, yeah, I'll sign something maybe, but ducked it. And, and this is a complete deviation from prior common law, right? So the case law clearly protected that right to an abortion and the right to privacy. That's true. This is a complete deviation. We've never seen that before. And what's interesting is when we talk about appointing our judges, right, with some of the main characteristics that they look for is whether or not the appointee, potential appointee, is in line with the governor's mm -hmm. ideology and whether or not there are judicial conservatives, essentially. So yet we see a Supreme Court that's full of judicial activists, apparently, um, but if back in the day, if they voiced that opinion, they would not have been appointed to begin with. Well, you know, what's really interesting is one of the justice, Justice Kennedy, his his wife is a state rep, Jennifer Kennedy, who who authored or co-sponsored the six week restriction. Yeah, it, it shows just how many intersections there are between uh, law making yeah. and law interpretation, uh, certainly in the state of Florida. I think another key piece um, that you brought up earlier that I think can't be underestimated, which is if they overturn, uh, or rather if they upheld the 15 week ban, it does overturn uh, precedence. And it does, and there had been some questions from the justices. The story decisis? Decisis. Decisis, right, about, about what the, essentially what the, uh, uh, what, the, what the waterfall effect is going to be right. if they take just this informational uh, privacy interpretation of the Florida Constitution. The other interesting point, Glenna, is two of the justices have a history of being a part of the anti-abortion movement. So when we say elections have consequences, that's not just a tagline. That shows you that you are electing people, judges, who bring to the bench their life experiences, their I political ideologies. Of course, conceptually in all issues. Absolutely. Right? But you're an attorney, you know that that's not how cases are decided. Cases are to be decided on the contextual limits of the law, the One would assume so. of the law. One would assume so, right. but as an attorney, I'm also aware that judges bring to the bench their own life experiences. That rosy colored glasses is always colored. It's not a clear focus on just what the law says. <laughs> I, I, so that's the issue. That's a why lot of red glasses on the Supreme Court a lot. Right now, That's okay. why it's yeah. important for the judges to accurately reflect the community that they serve. And when we talk about that and we talk about diversity, we're not just talking about sex and race, right? Mm. We're talking about socioeconomic diversity. We're talking about political diversity. The ideology of the Florida Supreme Court as it stands with those five out of the seven justices that are extremely conservative and appointed by DeSantis, does not reflect the entire state of Florida. And, you know, on segueing out of that, there is a citizens initiative underway. Um, you know, that's a, that's a, a heavy lift, but it does look like this group may have abortion rights on the November ballot. Unless the Supreme Court cancels it. Oh, that part. Uh, okay, mm -hmm. full stop right there. <laughs> um, let's, uh, let's table this for next time and we're gonna move on, but you're gonna come back in, in a little bit, but next, is the future of low-rise Art Deco Ocean Drive big new towers with affordable apartments? The first steps are actually underway and already destined for a fight. You'll be back to talk about that, but first, the attorney involved. Stay tuned. One of the best-known party spots in the middle of Miami Beach's Ocean Drive is now headlining location for what may be a sea change for developers and affordable housing. The owners of the Clevelander, an adjacent hotel, are planning to redevelop that corner of the Art Deco district into a residential tower, and a new state law makes that possible even if it's over objections of neighbors and local government zoning. Alex Tashmas is the attorney for those owners and is here with us today. Alex, great to see you. I'm so glad you're able to join us today. Thank you, Glenn. I appreciate you having me. 
So this is about the live local law that was passed, a new state law. We actually had the Senate President Kathleen Pasadomo here when she first filed it to address affordable housing issues. It sounded like something that was really going to attack one of the state's biggest problems. Is this is this plan sort of the first test case of development under the live local act? Well, I think it's certainly one of the newest uh, of applications that's going to be filed. The act only took effect on July 1st, mm -hmm. so it is a very new um, piece of legislation. I think there's already uh, an application that's been filed in Doral, but certainly in Miami Beach, this is the first one. Uh, and um, uh, I do think you're going to see other applications being filed uh, throughout the course of the, of the rest of the year. So I think to understand what the this issue is and is destined to be, it feels like, because the blowback has started already, there's uh, important for people who may not be in the weeds with the Live Local Act, kind of headline it for everybody. This was um, the affordable housing issue and a way to solve it comes down to kind of two headlines. One is to incentivize developers to build affordable housing more and to ease local roadblocks that may be in that development. So let's, I wanna just kind of take those one at a time and break it down. So what, if for your, um, for the owners of the Clevelander, I mean, that's a profitable nightlife business on Ocean Drive in the historic district. What is it that will have to happen cost-wise to make affordable housing sales and development profitable for them? So, uh, Glenn, a great question. Um, the, the, although the Live Local Act is going to be something that many different developers will use, regardless of their individual circumstances, the Clevelander is a bit unique. Um, as you know, there has been a, a very, very strong effort over the last five, six, seven years by the Miami Beach Commission and Mayor to shut down uh, bars and nightlife. Um, it's uh, pretty much almost every single commission agenda has had an item to roll back alcohol at two in the morning, shut down music, et cetera. And it got so bad that the Clevelander had to file suit uh, in order to survive. And uh, our clients have spent more than a million dollars on legal fees only to serve, only because uh, they need that to, to survive and to get the injunction we got. So um, the city at the same time has been asking the, the businesses to consider a different model, to have more residential product on the street. They're using the term more live, work, play to have more residential. But the problem is that up to now, the zoning regulations on Ocean Drive have not allowed, uh, have not been made economic sense to do anything other than hotel and nightlife. So uh, our client, once they saw the live local as an option, this was the first time that we saw uh, the ability to do something else uh, besides what we're doing now. But I will tell you, had it not been for the city's relentless attacks on our business, uh, we wouldn't be pursuing this. The Clevelander is profitable. It's a legendary, iconic business. And um, uh, we purchased it as a, as a bar and restaurant and, and honestly have, have no desire to change it but it's become unbearable to operate that kind of business. To right, well, let me let me just um, put out there that there's no one here from the city to refute that. And so I think what I've seen the city of Miami Beach do is look for more upscale and more tenable and more profitable businesses. I, I would guess that would kind of be their response to that. But but what you're doing, there are a couple, you know, every municipality, I think Doral, as a matter of fact, has already written a memo, uh, really raising some red flags about the implications of this. But putting what the plans look like a 30 story building in a low rise art, de art deco district. And the reason that would be allowed under Live Local is because Live Local takes away um, the spot zoning and allows what would be the biggest density number uh, for for this particular spot with matching what's in a mile. And of course, a mile of this, there are 30 story buildings. But but speak to how this would play in, in a low rise historic district. I think, you know, from my point of view, that's why everyone sort of has kind of thrown back their shoulders and said, what? So, you know, how how does that play? Right. And I and I, you know, I think that's a normal reaction to the, a, a very, um, a very new law that creates a new paradigm for development. So uh, first of all, I will say that that um, we've only issued the press release uh, two days ago, two business days ago. And I think everyone needs to take a breath and get to know our project better before they make you know, you know, a lot of statements that are dismissive of what we want to do. 
So we have reached out to the city's planning department and we're waiting for a response to meet with them to discuss the project. We are already in discussions with uh, trading emails with MDPL, the historic organization. Um, we are gonna fully preserve the Clevelander and Essex on site. And then there will be a tower uh, of new construction. The maximum is going to be around 30 stories. That doesn't mean that's what it's going to be. Um, it will be more than current zoning allows, but um, uh, there are, are plenty of projects around Miami Beach where you have new towers next to historic buildings. You've got that all over the place on Collins Avenue. Um, and um, uh, admittedly, there is nothing that tall on Ocean Drive, but the, the concept of a historic building preserved next to a, a taller building is, um, uh, is something that, that is relatively common in the city. Um, but, but I will tell you, Jenna, it's, uh, Glenn, I'm sorry, it, it, um, it comes to an existential issue for Ocean Drive. We, we, you know, there has been no residential housing or, or affordable housing uh, on Ocean Drive in years. And um, if, if the city really wants to change in business model, it can't be done under the existing zoning. And that's why you're not seeing anybody else change what they've got. Um, let me and, let me ask you one before I we have like a minute left. Why you know this has become controversial already? Why announce to the public these plans before even submitting plans to the city? Why does the public know about this before the city does? Because we, we, we think it's important for you know, this to be put into proper context. Um, we think this is the affordable housing issue was a major point. And uh, uh, there's a crisis in South Florida with affordable housing. And, and you know, we want everyone in the community, not just in a private meeting with staff. We want all the stakeholders that are in on Ocean Drive and South Beach to understand what we want to do. We would normally in another project, you're right, we would just meet with staff first in a private setting, but, but this is a game changer for the community. And, and we wanted to engage all the stakeholders in a discussion about, about whether this, you know, whether what, what will be next on Ocean Drive and this project. I suspect we will be in touch and watching this for the foreseeable future. Alex, thanks so much. I appreciate the context and uh, always grateful for your time. Thank you, nice to see you. And up next, the round table is back to weigh in. We are back with the round table. We have Tom Hudson, L'Oreal Arscott, Mark Caputo, Kevin Cooper. We were watching the last segment. We are going right to the economics guy. Not <laughs> it, too many numbers. No, it's television. No, but this is a fascinating <laughs> test case of this state law, right? I mean, this is going to put it, the Doral case notwithstanding. This is Miami Beach, right? This is uh, the the uh, the the epicenter diamond, the epicenter of, of development, <laughs> and of course, a focus of a lot of Florida and elsewhere. Uh, but in order for this project on paper to make economic sense, that's why they need 30 stories, right? So you've got the affordable housing piece, you have the high-end restaurant. The affordable housing piece are going to be rental in uh, rental uh, apartments as opposed to condominiums. But in order for this to happen, that's why they need the square footage to go up. And that's why they're trying to, frankly, put this new state law to the test as it relates to uh, uh, the, being able to, to step into the zoning argument. Because what we, we really didn't get into the, the mechanics of the law with, with Alex, but 40, if a developer makes 40% of this building affordable housing, then the local people can't say no to the development. And this is what, this is like a pox on all their houses or housing, if you will. <laughs> it's the 11th like, plague. Like, <laughs> let's, let's face it, the, the, the Florida legislature doesn't really care about affordable housing. They care about developers and development, though. Uh, yeah, that's harsh. Okay, I'm yeah, having okay. spent, oh, no, having no, no, spent no, no, 20 years that's covering right. the Florida legislature, I will, I I will defer, adhere to my, my position. And <laughs> local government, which is always like, oh, affordable housing, they never really provide it because they need to change the zoning, by and large, to allow for more density. So you've now got two bad faith actors, and then they meet on Ocean Drive. <laughs> where they've decided to tell the Clevelander, hey, you can't be a bar. And so the, what you heard from the lawyer here was like, oh, okay, you know, we can't have our bar anymore? Okay, screw you. We're going to build something that you don't like, which you say you like, because it has affordable housing. Well, what, affordable housing is workforce housing. I mean, the people who work on Ocean Drive right. can live. Okay, I've got the numbers. Forgive me, it's television. I can't have a lot of numbers. But $122,000 annual income is the income that is considered the income that would be um, the threshold. a threshold that's right. that would make you uh, affordable housing worthy. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's, you know, that's not, that's not poverty level. That's definitely not low income, no. right? So, so what's wrong with 
beautiful housing for people who work? I think the mayor of Miami Beach and the commissioners are gonna have a tough time explaining mm, that to the right. city. So the thing that's, that's interesting about this statute is it absolutely takes the power out of the local municipalities. That's exactly what preemption is, right? But this is a move from Tallahassee that's been happening a long time. Many of the municipalities have been watching slowly but surely as how the legislature is taking the power out of the hands of local government and is preempting, for lack of a better word, that authority. So is that, I mean, Kevin, is that problematic because, you know, some in the state will tell you, well, maybe we know better and for the people, but local government is who represents the people on the ground. You know, why, why shouldn't Miami Beach have a say in what their zoning is on any particular block? We haven't heard from the city on this topic yet. Oh, no, oh, we've, we've heard, heard from the mayor, yes. You, you may I not watch, heard. yeah, you <laughs> haven't heard. <laughs> oh, well, let me just fill you in in good faith because um, the mayor's against it and said he will do everything to fight it then why doesn't he work to clean up Ocean Drive? Because Ocean Drive has experienced just this year, there were two shootings in 36 hours. P people were literally killed on Ocean Drive this year. I saw a video on Instagram where they were washing the blood off the sidewalk while a walking tour of tourists walked by. I think it's absurd what's going on and on Ocean so, Drive. So, and so connect they want that to protect, with the 30-story 30, 30 building for affordable Well, you housing. heard from the developer. He said Miami, Miami Beach Ocean Drive has become unbearable. He said that word, unbearable. And so- As a business. Well, because yeah, because of the, because of the actually, situation of what's going on. But there. it's because yeah. of the government actually trying to stop the shootings, though. That's the irony. Then maybe they're going about it the wrong way. Yeah. But I don't think there's been a cohesive effort on behalf of the city to really fix this issue. And now they've, they've punished everybody except for the people who are committing the crimes. You know, it's, what's, what, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, the real problem that the city had, just to bring it back to my remarks earlier, is they haven't really done a good job allowing for more affordable housing and now someone's calling their bluff, and now the city's against it. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's true across Florida, certainly true across oh, South totally. Florida, right? Where we, we have, we, and as a, as a country, we have prioritized single family home development uh, a, at the expense of density. And we're seeing density around Miami-Dade County finally build up along some of the transit corridors, for instance. That only took 40 years <laughs> for Miami-Dade County to realize, oh, train stations, people like to live near transportation. And you still got to get back and forth from the train station. It'd be <laughs> nice to have some more trains. That's yeah. right. You know? Let me let me ask you this. Did you read the bill? I don't want to put you on the spot if you haven't read the whole. It's a 95 pages. Oh, it's 95 pages. You read it, didn't you? <laughs> Not all 95 oh, okay. pages. <laughs> so you're kind of an overachiever. I have a anyway. life sometimes. But here's, in, in, the, in the context of the bill, it, ca it keeps referring to county. County can't do this. County can't do that. Does that mean the cities can't either, or is that at all encompassing, or is that a, a word that we can play with? The cities can't either. Um, I thought I captured some of the language here, but it says local government. So local government's inability to um, further regulate zoning, density, et cetera. So to the point earlier, uh, the local government, Miami Beach, should be best primed to, to dictate what they believe the standards of beauty should be for their community, what they believe those zoning standards should be. That's the whole purpose of us having local government. Yeah. It, I shouldn't come from Miami Gardens and tell Miami Beach what I think should be proper for the Art Deco District. The residents of Miami Beach should speak to that. It's kind of difficult for Tallahassee to then come in and altruistically, paternalistically, whichever word we want to give them, and so then the affordable housing crisis. And that's tension. that's the catch because that sounds really great on paper. But, you know, the uh, interesting that you compare cities because you know South Florida is growing into a, a much more urban area than it ever has been. In urban areas, they have mixed use. In New right. York, there's the businesses and people live on top of them. Yeah. Is that what we're destined for? Well, it's called infill, right? We've, infill. we've pushed up all the way against the Everglades. We can't build east anymore because of the ocean. There's no room to move south. There's no room to move north. We're squeezed here in this little slice of paradise that we call home, so you've got to build up. And so that's what's that's what developers have been looking at, but the price of the land itself, that is what is driving the expense of houses. Unless they change the urban development boundary, and that's a whole other and round table. To the oh, just, oh. just give them a okay, few no, minutes. No, 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 no. No. Gotta go, gotta go. Tom Hudson, L'Oreal, R. Scott, Mark Caputo, Kevin Cooper, I love you all. Great round table, <laughs> and I value your time, and I love that you come in and sit with us on a Sunday morning. Thank you. Thank we'll you for having us. And we will be right back. Quick programming note, Local 10 is celebrating the life of Jimmy Buffett, whose music you know helped define the Florida Keys vibe. Tonight at 7, we air a Local 10 special, Jimmy Buffett, A Trip Around the Sun, hosted by Janine Stanwood, and right after, at 7.30, Florida
Florida Keys at 200, celebrating paradise, the history, beauty, vibrant culture of our Florida Keys. As for us, we want to hear from you about today's show or anything you like. Find, follow, and reach out on social media at Glenna WPLG on Instagram, X, you know, Twitter, Facebook. <laughs> Have a beautiful Sunday and remember, keep in touch.